थ्री टू वन रेडी अंकल या ओके वी आर रोलिंग अंकल हाउ यू डूइंग रोलिंग हैप्पी टू सी आई एम गुड हे हैप्पी टू सी यू what is yeah. what is happening you like your the, new look you liking the look thank you so much yeah yeah great great yeah. how has the so lockdown been for you are you uh, you just mentioned right before we started recording that you've been reflecting a lot what what kind of things are you discovering about yourself at the moment oh lot of things yeah that i'm some i'm keeping some i'm rejecting <laughs> <laughs> like what? what what's the latest highlight of of something that you are uh, looking at oh making music yeah that's what i do yeah and uh, writing things in fact i'm writing a book oh wow what's it about uh uh it's there's a little bit of shine and reflection over the book but if you could read it out a guide to jazz improvisation 12 golden steps created compiled by louis banks perfect uncle as that this is a great gift to us thank you so much for this <laughs> so how much of it it is done uh, right now almost done it's done it's done now okay. i need to publish it have you found a yeah, publisher i'm going through not yet but i have a man i have a guy working on it great yeah so this is one of the things of course and then writing music thank goodness gino's around so we are making a lot of music together mm. yeah a lot of time to do things actually yeah creating stuff yeah only what i miss is the live playing you know with an audience in front of you mm. i miss that very much i miss that very much because it's not the same thing Yes right. Playing online like uh, you don't see the audience yeah. Yeah. So it's not the same vibe at all. So yeah. you know thinking about uh, or rather talking about this live thing people being in front of you and uh, recording uh, something not even recording just performing. But you come from a time when you have recorded albums while you were playing live. Like uh, your time in Calcutta 1978 with Braz uh Gonzalez and Pam uh, Pam Pam Crane you released an album yeah, Aspirations yeah. and it's all happening then and there it's a live recording I know which which doesn't happen right now which is something that uh, we do release singles we do release two three songs yeah but how was that experience when you were playing a gig and you know it's being recorded and tomorrow it's going to be printed and it's going to be sold what were you going through at that moment and how much were you preparing for it not really except getting the material ready mm -hmm. with the boys and uh, and then not thinking about the recording at all mm. just playing the music so um, your rehearsals were essentially because um, you spent tons and tons of years playing in different residencies the blue fox fox hotel hindustan hotel and you were already seasoned and when this moment comes for a musician like you you already have played it so many number of times that you're not even thinking of the recording altogether right absolutely absolutely those were great times you know playing every night mm -hmm. is a great thing it's a great thing for musicians really yeah to hone your skills yeah to correct what you were doing wrong and things like that I mean the whole feeling the vibe and everything is I mean nothing can replace it really yeah I miss that right now when uh, like I wasn't so much exposed to that time of music until you know mm. I decided to have a word with you then I went deeper into that era and it almost feels like a downfall right now because <laughs> the level of musicianship <laughs> and the horn sections i heard from 78 and time around that uh huh it was a beautiful thing to listen to and uh, right. how much do you think there is a need for places where musicians can get residencies and get themselves seasoned like even if it's once a week kind of a situation uh it'd be great but it's not happening hmm. what to do yeah but once this lockdown i mean lifts and everything is unlocked and we're back to normal 
hopefully things get better. Yeah. And hopefully we'll push for live things happening everywhere. Yeah, in clubs, in different outlets, and then hopefully then on concert stage. Yeah. Agil, you've, you've seen decades and decades of music industry shift and change. There's uh, one thing I wondered is, when was this switch exactly that the live bands who were always there, who had a regular job at the hotels, when did that switch happen from not having li live bands to something else? When was that time exactly? And what was the reason behind it, that they stopped having uh, live bands altogether? I don't know really because I myself uh, started doing, getting into the recording business. And then, uh, then the live playing slowly, slowly diminished. Uh, though I tried to keep it up, but uh, it got, got to a point where I couldn't do both things. It was right. too strenuous. I mean, recording all day and then playing in the night, recording all day, playing in the night. Yeah, that happened for some time. Uh, this was, uh, I'm talking about Bombay, when I came to Bombay, mm -hmm. when I was recording with R.D. Berman and all that. Uh, and then when I was doing jingles and stuff like that, yeah, because my day was full with recording. Mm -hmm. And then rushed home, got into some nice dinner jacket and, <laughs> and, ready to go again. and went ready to go to the nightclub and do the thing at the nightclub. Yeah, it's great, but it's very strenuous, very strenuous. But gone and done that. So do you think when uh, DJs were introduced or music that could be played off CDs or whatever, that was the turning point for musicians to be not present? In some ways, yes. In some ways, definitely yes. And <laughs> the, when the the pop sing scene, the pop scene, commercial mm -hmm. music, yeah, disco music, that uh, started becoming very popular with the young crowd, and they love to dance to all that stuff. Slowly, slowly, the live music scene deteriorated. Yeah, definitely, that's one of the biggest causes. Yeah, so I would say. After the 70s, the 80s, I think it came on strong and and then the uh, owners of all these outlets realized, hey, we don't have to pay, pay the band so much mm. money. Yeah, when we can just keep one guy, a DJ and get play all the music and the crowd comes in. So that was definitely... Yeah. But were these the same people who experienced sets like you were playing sets where you were playing uh, swing sets and people were dancing to live swing music or live disco music? Were these the same people who switched to that DJ thing? No, no, not really, not really. Barring a few, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a, a different kind of a crowd, mostly the young crowd, absolutely. Mm. Not the plus 40, yeah. And that generation never got to experience that whole uh, horn section getting into Absolutely. your body, into your bones and shaking the hell out of you and then you dance to Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. They missed all that. And that's why I have the youngsters, barring a few, of course, serious minded guys. The rest uh, don't bother about yeah the stuff that we really play. We like to play the serious stuff of music, good music, really. Yeah, that comes from the heart, original music and all that. What to do? How to get this back on track? Do you think exposing people to this whole, uh, specifically, you know, orchestration of, of, uh, of something that shakes the air, not, not uh, sounds that we produce from a backing track or something like that, do you think uh -huh. that can bring the whole thing back where once they experience a horn section, once they experience a big band, they they would like to go to that again and again? Let's say there's a club which says that we're going to have a horn section from tomorrow, we're going to have a piano player, a string section, and they're all going to play back-to-back -back gigs for a week, for two weeks. What do you think it can lead to? Can it lead oh, to a oh. change, you think? Definitely. 
but then we got to have a good horn section <laughs> in order to back that up, <laughs> which we are sorely lacking in India. That's true. <laughs> really. I, I uh, mean, that's now... why the people, the musicians, are not getting into horns mm. because they don't they see don't see an opening for it. They're always in. They're into keyboards, drums, bass, guitar. That's about all. And if I ask a youngster, come on, learn some trumpet, learn some saxophone, you hardly have anybody. You can just name a few guys on your fingers and uh, say, yeah, these guys can handle things like this, but the rest are nothing. So when you write stuff for horn section, difficult to find the players to play it. Mm. I've written so much stuff, some very challenging and all that, but where are the people to play it? Where are the musicians to play it? So the lineage... I miss that. I miss that lot. I miss that very much. So I'm sending out my music abroad, right? Because you know the horn sections abroad. Oh God! Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, right. We're not learning from them really. But but that's what was fascinating to me when I was digging into your older albums. When I was listening to the horn sec- sections that were playing in Calcutta, <laughs> I can't say. I can't even say that it's it's done in India. It is so good. It is so perfect. That's why I was talking to you in the beginning and saying that it almost seems like a downgrade. Now we're talking about the horn players not being there to play all that music. Yeah. But but also I you know I experienced I don't know if you have uh, uh, attended Reese has been writing a lot of material. Uh Fanculos has been writing a lot of material. And uh, it's kind of this reintroduction to having a four piece horn section there's a trumpet there's tenor there's alto and uh, i think reese is playing something else all, as well but um, that does drive people i'm i'm seeing that happen that it there is something extremely fascinating about the whole experience that people are, are getting out of it i feel that yes if there's enough players to do all that job it will be very nice do it'll you think great. yeah do, do you think it's a <laughs> Com- if you compare the two if you compare trying to play a bunch of notes on trumpet and compare trying to play a bunch of notes on guitar or piano the reward is quicker on guitar and piano that's why this whole change is happening that people want to get some gratification sooner i guess so yeah i guess so yeah yeah you might be right yeah horn so, sections yeah oh god mm. i'm doing horn sections on the keyboard can you believe it yeah yes i i hear that i hear that often <laughs> yeah because so, i can't get guys and yeah guys to come over and then play the thing do i'm trying i'm trying i'm trying very much and i heard a few horn players here and there uh who have the potential i think mm. uh mm. but you have to give them some challenging material that i haven't really tried except mm. for reese and shirish malhotra yeah, 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 yeah these yeah. guys can handle that and there are a few other youngsters who are picking it up and i'm en- encouraging them mm. and hopefully yeah the tribe will increase that's great so also uh, you know i've wondered and wanted to talk to you about this that when i talk to somebody like you or i talk to gino or even sheldon for that matter when you people grew up there was this whole ocean of music around all of you that you were listening to you had the environment and you had uh, you know somebody to ask what do i listen to next what is this music what's going on like your dad played trumpet for Gino you were already yeah. there and you could guide him that hey listen to her be now check the vocal out uh-huh. check this out that out so it brings a certain pace and certain um environment to your uh, your progress as a musician what happens is there are people like me like there's there's no music in my family as such i'm mm-hmm. uh, my roots are from punjab my dad is as punjabi as it can get so i didn't listen uh-huh. to beatles un- until 6 years ago that's the oh. kind of story i am coming from uh. but when i talk to somebody i'll they'll tell me that they've been listening to the beatles since they were 6 so <laughs> now what happens is 
and I, what I wanted to ask you that in a case where somebody chooses to do his or start his musical journey at the age of 21, 22, whatever, and that's the first time he starts stepping into this territory. What is it that can help him to come to a place where he can, he can, does he make a choice consciously to sink himself into an environment where he finds a mentor like you or Gino or somebody else, starts hanging with them? What is your advice to people like that who did not grow in musical environments or are not a part of any kind of a generation of music? At 21, is the guy playing? Mm -hmm. Or he's just learning the instrument? Or he's, he's already play. playing it mm -hmm. in a professional capacity? Is he? Uh, let's, let's assume uh, he is, yes. Let's say yeah. he is playing. Uh. Then we'll come to if he's not playing. Then I would like then to hear both perspectives. Then I would advise him to listen to music that mm. has horns. Yeah. And if possible, try and get transcriptions. Yeah, for horns. And uh, definitely, yeah, the starting point is that, yeah. But to listen to a lot of music with horns, definitely. So that'll sort of inspire him, yeah. And then, of course, he needs to play the music. So he needs. Now, before that, the criteria is he's got to be able to read music. Okay. For me, that's the biggest criteria, really. Mm. Learn to read music, of course. So take, taking that he knows music and he can read music, to listen to music and to get transcriptions of horn parts, and then find people he can sit in with mm -hmm. and then come to people like me to mm -hmm. jam jam with yeah <laughs> then he'll start growing definitely definitely how do you I'm compare? looking for people like that <laughs> hey send them to me <laughs> no I will I was just send generally asking me. as overall really? overall a musician not just horn players but I I get I think uh, I get your point my also the other thing I want you to um, talk about is that there is this whole going to a music school and then you know some miracle is going to happen after a music school gets over or after one finishes their grades or something like that. What is your take on mentorship versus going to a music school? What can make an individual grow faster, give them real um, life experiences so what's your take on that should one choose mentorship or should one choose going to a music school either actually yeah hmm. uh, going to a music school is great actually really great because the the learning thing is graded yeah and uh, you have to get serious about it and your growth will be very nicely graded and uh, the, the the development will be very smooth, and uh, and then you fall into a kind of a routine and practice that will help you, and then the whole uh, interaction with other musicians will start happening. Uh, so it's very good like that. Yeah, it's very helpful. Yeah, I didn't go to music school. Yes, I went to a mentor, and my father was there. We were lucky like that. Gino, he came to me. Yeah, I taught him a few things, but then he was so serious about music that he started applying to researching himself. Yeah, and uh, that can happen. And mentorship is great like that. Yeah, and for the not so gifted musician, music school is great really great hmm. yeah to really okay. get into serious music learning so music school can help you get disciplined it can help Dep you get in exactly. get into a place where you understand how practice works you interact you exactly. see other people exactly discipline yep. exactly but here's uh, something that often happens and uh, there are times when people finish music school and they realize they have not really progressed 
really? but then then there are people who have mentorship and they progress year after year after year and they are flying do you notice that uh not really but uh, i get your point yeah okay like mentorship is really more it's more concentrated yeah and then uh you get to see the master who you're learning from and there's so many things that that you find in that that is very different from a school yeah and uh, maybe your development is better in that way in that sense yeah definitely yeah and you get inspired like the mm. inspiration of your mentor and your master yeah and G the next thing is of course if you are a genius then it's okay yeah no problem <laughs> then no school no <laughs> mentorship <laughs> you just you just wake up and you're good to play <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> so you uh, like gino is extremely disciplined about work his work ethic is very clear and of course when we are growing up we are learning from our parents that's the first exposure to the whole world that's how that's we behave when gino was growing up were you extremely disciplined routine with your work all the time was it happening like clockwork day in day out that's where he got this habit from that i have to be at work at 10 and finish at 6 or whatever it is yes definitely yeah. i was disciplined like that yeah and then i of course i learned that from my father definitely yeah he was very disciplined man and uh, he taught everything he got me started and uh, he was a great musician to start with and uh, he taught me the the basics mm -hmm. and then i was lucky at the early age of 13 he gave me a chance to sit in with his professional band hmm no these are experiences that many youngsters do not get yeah really mm. yeah and that helped me a great yeah because i had to sit in with musicians and try and play the music that they are playing mm. so the development and the growth was faster for me like that and i learned a hell of a lot of things yeah doing it and uh, that helped that's interesting so there's one more thing uncle which is as i mentioned already that you've seen decades of music industry change this and that happen there's one thing where musicians find themselves stuck a lot which is uh giving themselves a raise in terms of let's say asking for more money even if they are in their regular band and um, in fact i was talking to avishek the other day and he was only mentioning that this happens i i if i play at a fixed rate for 2 years and ask for a raise i might be called off the gig and somebody else might be called in so musicians always have find themselves in a place where they say that i work very hard but i don't get paid enough in your case you have built a whole empire i would say you have a family you have your own house you have a great career did you face challenges in terms of giving yourself raises uh quoting a certain price how did you keep um building your brand keep charging more and more as time went by yeah in the early days of course you took whatever you got yeah and and be happy about it but those were days those were the days that uh, you could live with a little mm -hmm. now you need a little more to live well the days have changed of course times have changed mm -hmm. but uh, what i was lucky like that uh, uh when i started uh, playing professionally with my own band and uh, of course i never demanded anything i took whatever i got yeah and i was quite happy with it because i got a chance to work with these musicians and to create music that i wanted to create original music most of the time and even play 
uh, commercial music the way I wanted to play that. Yeah. So I was very happy to have a guys around me who thought the same and were willing to learn and develop themselves and make themselves into better musicians and play challenging material and things like that. So that gradually happened and that really started when I was in Nepal, of all the places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kathmandu. Yes. Where I got my f <laughs> first band together mm. in a hotel. Yeah. For me, a youngster who had never got regular pay till then, and I get to form my own band and got a fair bit of money for it. Yeah. Uh, that was great for me. Yeah. And uh, so I never really bothered about the money part. I was quite happy with whatever I got. But I was more concerned with developing my band hmm. and developing my music. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that happened. And of course, that happened for a couple of years and all that. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I got an offer to come to Calcutta, where I got more money mm -hmm. yeah, to form my own band. So it was a gradual yeah, transition like that. Uh, and uh, it all depends on the city that you are playing in and the, and the clientele that the outlet gets, uh, the club or whatever hotel, yeah, restaurant. Yeah, and that depends. And then the band gets offered a certain amount, a certain fee, yeah, because on the on their this thing earnings and uh, so it was a gradual process that uh, I was quite happy with that yeah but you were and focusing then, on uh, constantly building credibility as a good musician exactly exactly and the financial raise that you got was as a consequence of of your credibility increasing your musicianship increasing you being able to do two things three things ten things leading a band and everything so all my years in Darjeeling, in Kathmandu, and Calcutta, all that, money was not the criteria at all. Mm. I was just living hand to mouth. Mm. No house, living in a rented place, no cars, nothing just being happy to play the music that I wanted to play. Mm. All that changed when I came to Bombay. Mm. I discovered money. <laughs> <laughs> I had never seen money like that yeah. ever. Yeah. And I thought to myself, God, here I'm earning in one day what I used to earn in one month in Calcutta. Mm. I mean, it was incredible. Right. That's so all that started happening. The money thing started happening when I came to Bombay, really. Yeah, because the commercial thing was so big in that, and the film industry was so big. The advertising industry was so big. Yeah, so I did not have to even worry about anything. Hmm. The money was good. I mean, it was not good, but very, very good. Mm. And uh, and I got a chance. I was lucky like that. I got a chance to create my own music mm. in that situation. Mm. Yeah. In the films, of course, I worked with Adi Berman and Lachmi Khan Pyarelal and Papi Lahiri and all that. Mm -hmm. And I played their music. Yeah. And with very little input from my side, my creations. But when I really got into advertising, that's where I really started composing my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was on a daily basis. Uh, and finances were really good. Right. And the whole standard of living really went up. Mm. And everything was hunky-dory. 
Right. So it sounds like a chain of events which happened as a consequence of your credibility being so high because um, even the way R D Burman discovered you was because you played so well in a uh, in a hotel where you were playing at and R D Burman was there, and he said that he wants to have you on board for the film Mukti, and things just formed a cycle from there, one after the other. Now. Yeah. That's that's interesting because uh, it's interesting to know that you never thought about what next financial plan am I going to have in terms of building more wealth, but I think the only thing you were focusing on was more and more music, and how you can just develop this whole thing where music is just going for uh, the best possible. So you were you were writing your own music you mentioned, and uh, Sangam is one of the things that. when i hear it i get goosebumps um, and especially <laughs> when when you write a song like city lights it's called right which is 18 minutes long about 18 minutes long city, city life city life yeah so ha was that uh, your idea that we are going to write a song that long which is 18 minutes long or it just so happened in the in the moment that everybody improvised for long enough times that the song stretched out <laughs> yeah yeah actually mm. uh, but uh, i must tell you that sangam was the beginning of my uh uh music uh, my fusion music actually mm. yeah uh, uh because before that i never wrote fusion music really i really wasn't into indian music as such mm. in in classical music uh but when i heard rama mani sing and it just struck me that she would be a really ideal partner for me to explore mm. the raga scales and then blend it with jazz and i approached her and she was excited she said she wants to do it and then she introduced me to some carnatic scales and all that mm -hmm. which i took and i wrote compositions based on those skills on those scales but she was the first big inspiration for me really rama mani incredible musician incredible singer and the pieces that we created uh was like i mean i still remember them i hardly play them now really hmm. uh i hardly play those tunes really they're fantastic and we are, we are just still planning let's have a sangam 2 you should concert you should. but uh, let's see after this pandemic maybe and city life of course i wanted to i don't know it just happened that i was fooling around uh, doodling on the piano as i normally do mm -hmm. and then uh, this thing cycle of uh one beats uh was suggested to me by rama bani mm. yeah uh the corner call things that they do yeah which is like Three fives and one six, mm. so that excited me very much. Yeah, and I wrote the bass line. <laughs> that kind of thing, right. you know. <laughs> and uh, then I developed the melodies and then wrote different parts. Yeah, and there was of course. in the beginning there was uh, brass gonzalez of course definitely mm. they had played all those parts did he actually Carl Peters on bass at any moment play bass. two horns together did he because uh, there's a picture of him playing a tenor and alto together yes he did, he that? did that not not with sangam mm. but, but he, he used to do that when he, yeah i know amazing <laughs> i saw i saw him doing that i saw him doing that yeah so you were saying amazing was... one of the best saxophonists uh, india has ever had really agreed brass gonzalez absolutely yeah i mean he was like colchen to me yeah he had that kind of a sound and feel mm. you know he was a great lover of colchen music and he had that kind of sound and lines and all that uh, coming from colchen yeah, yeah beautiful yeah most lyrical player yeah So and then I wrote this piece. I think the, the boys from Sangam say it was the most difficult piece they played ever played. Yeah. What was uh, Carl especially? Carl especially <laughs> to play on that bass. You know, oh, it was tough. It's not easy. What was Ranjit yeah. uh, uh, Ranjit's reaction to this? He must have been really excited. 
He very excited and what a drummer. Yeah. yeah. God, when I auditioned uh, uh, for bass player and drummer for the Sangam band, mm. and I heard Carl Peters, there's no question. Mm -hmm. I said Carl Peters on bass, definitely. And when I heard Ranjit, wow. And I tested them on this on this tune mm -hmm. only. On this 21 City Life tune. Mm. And Ranjit just got into it. Really amazing. And the way it goes into that bossa, the sudden hiccup that happens. That's mind-boggling. <laughs> and it's tight. And then Rama Ramamani's inputs on it. Mm -hmm. God. That's why it became so long. But it was our totally force in all the concerts. Mm. That was the last number that we played. Sometime it extended, extended to half a half a uh, half an hour, wow. thirty minutes. Wow. And we, most of the time, we always got a standing ovation for this piece. Yeah, it was amazing. God, it is magical. Were you at this point of time listening to, uh, or were you inspired by Herbie Hancock's music that was coming out around that time? Yeah, I used to listen to a lot of that. Yeah. So. Because yeah. it sounds like a lot of influences are there, definitely sound-wise, and it's kind of he's my man, <laughs> <Herbie>. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm totally inspired by him. Yeah, he's is quite a guy. So when you're understanding a raga, when you're trying to learn a raga, you come from first you learn classical music, you learn classical piano, you spent your years with that. Then uh, you play jazz and then there is this time when you realize I have to do film music, I have to understand how a rag works, then you start writing inside ragas. Uh, you understand all the ragas because um, you write so much music in them and you have composed uh, tunes like Mile Sur Mera Tumhara. What's your approach when you as a western musician first time, you heard that okay I need to understand how this thing works. Do you remember what it was like to get getting introduced to a raga for the first time, and how you learned it I, and grasped? I must the whole tell you that thing? I don't know much about Indian music and Indian ragas. Mm -hmm. uh, what I uh, the way I use Indian ragas is the scales. Mm. Yeah, I use the scales, and that gives me the flavor of Indian lines, and I develop lines out of that scale. Hmm. Beyond that, I don't know much about ragas and the connection of the scales. Correct. And I have never studied ragas. Mm -hmm. I just get inspired by those scales. Right. Uh, so that's the way I use it then. Yeah. So basically it restricts you in a certain set of notes and then of course that set of notes is producing that specific emotion for you and then you compose around it and then things start happening around like Absolutely, in a magical manner. So my lines are very different from a way an Indian music Indian musician uses the raga. That's correct. And the way I use a raga scale is totally different. But you use, you yeah. see it as a scale because in Indian music, as we know, you I just see it as a yeah, scale. Yeah. You can't follow certain patterns to create a certain raga. You have to avoid certain notes and all that. But I understand what you're saying. It's a set of notes, and uh -huh. we harmonize the set of notes to create uh, another kind of emotion, basically. So, yeah. you paint a lot, you have tons of paintings around your house, in your house and uh, <laughs> I wanted to ask how, how it relates to your musical progress. Was it something you picked up before music or was it something you eventually decided that I want to do something else, explore something else? No, painting has been with me since child childhood. Mm. I was interested in drawing right from school. I used to try and draw portraits of the actress Meena Kumari. <laughs> <laughs> A young boy getting fascinated with her beauty. Auntie Lorraine is listening. Catch it. <laughs> <laughs> Auntie Lorraine is listening. She knows about it. <laughs> okay, then we are safe. <laughs> yeah. So I was interested in drawing right from beginning. Yeah. Right from early days. Yeah. And it never left me actually, yeah, and I just continued, I really enjoy. For me, it is making music without sound. Mm. Painting is that for me, yeah. It's another way I express myself without sound, making a sound. 
Yeah, so I paint like a jazz man, really. Whatever hits me, I start from one point and then it just progresses. Yeah, the, this exactly the way I play, I paint the, exactly the same way. Mm. It's pretty interesting. Have you put those things um, on sale, on exhibition any, anywhere yet? Not yet, not yet. Do you plan no, my to sons do so? Are, yes, my sons are really planning. Wow. Dad, we must have an exhibition, exhibition. Yeah, I said, yeah, go on, set it up. <laughs> That'll be beautiful. <laughs> Uncle, there's this, uh, you know, there are certain concepts that we are taught as, uh, as students of music that we need to engage in active listening. Uh, you just sit down and you s just listen to music deeply. Have you ever done that when you were younger? I guess I did, yeah. When it started right from early days, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, my introduction to jazz was Oscar Peterson. Yeah, that you might have heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that he inspired me and I heard that kind of piano playing. I said that at the time I really got into jazz. Yeah. And I wanted to play like him, mm -hmm. of course. I tried to play like him. I never got to that stage, that, that standard of playing. But I used to transcribe so his solos and try to play those solos the best as, as I could. Yeah, and... Uh, and then, then I heard Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea and Errol Ghana, all these people, Makoi Taina and all that. And that opened my mind even more mm -hmm. to different styles of approaches. And the style that I really loved was Herbie, Herbie Hancock, really. The way he explored harmonies of standards, they changed them around. It was magical, really. And that's what I try to do in my compositions, yeah. And when I play standards and all that, that's the way, that's the way I like to approach things and reharmonize standards always, yeah, the way Herbie, Herbie does. Right. Really, yeah. I also feel that, you know, in the older times, this, uh, when we used to listen to music and all these sounds, they used to just suck us inside them because... Entertainment right now is almost on steroids. It's so much amplified, it's so hardcore, it's so colorful, it's so attractive that like when I listen to your other interviews in them, you talk about that we didn't have anything else to do. We would just rehearse, we would play, we would come home and relax and we would play. But right now the whole thing of we go home, we watch Netflix, then we get into binge watching, Things like that keep happening. <laughs> but uh, like the other day, somebody was asking me about this active listening thing. And it's kind of hard to attain at the moment because I don't know if the music or if music in itself is stimulating people the way it used to, like in the older times. Because the forms of entertainment have evolved and they are so charged, they are so uh, uh, almost aggressive. Yesterday we saw a black and white movie called... Uh, uh, 12, uh, was 12 Angry Men. It's a very old movie in the se from the 70s. I don't know if you've watched it. But no. the, the beautiful part of it was there was not much music. There was the introduction music and there was the music in the end. That's about it. The rest of it, it was like a play. And there was, in the beginning, there was this jitteriness because we are used to, you know, airplanes flying around <laughs> and bombs falling from here and there but this this movie was like a big play that you watched you sat down and just got yourself into so in terms of active listening right now uh, what is your take on it because people are not getting that that kind of a charge that you would hear herbie hancock and you like what the hell is happening where is the sound coming from how can one get into the routine of of a similar experience like you were entering into I know it's very difficult now. It's very, yeah, it's very, very difficult now because so much music is happening that uh, really doesn't really help you in your own growth as a serious musician. Uh, the thing is, shut yourself out from this, all these commercial things that is happening. Yeah, not all of it is bad. Some are good. Yeah, definitely. There's a place for that music also. It's entertainment, yeah. 
Yeah, but it's here today and it's gone tomorrow. Uh, uh, but uh, don't let go of the serious side of music, really. And listen to the good people, really. On Indian television, you don't hear it. But there are other outlets there where you can get access to this mu uh, music. And, of course, records. And online, of course, there's a lot of music in online that... I mean, incredible amount of music. Uh, you cannot say that. No, I didn't get a chance to listen to any serious stuff. You cannot give that excuse now because it's all available. Anything you want. Mm. Yeah. And all the teachers are there teaching you everything now, actually. Yeah. It's all out there. It's amazing. It's all out there, actually. You just have to be interested, yeah, and serious about it and get into it, there's no problem, really. When you were first time given the leadership role uh, to lead a band, and uh, before that you were a session musician, you were playing piano for others, was that specific role that you got uh, to lead a band, did you feel that your progress as a musician really, really got faster? You sped up uh, all the processes a lot more? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's why... Uh, when I really, uh, when I was a band leader and I had my own band, and me, I love writing music. Mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you, in, in uh, Calcutta Blue Fox, each of my musicians had five books written by you. Their stands written by me mm. because on, almost on a daily basis I would write tunes for them to play mm -hmm. and then it was all numbered and I would call out okay let's play number 65 in the second book and they would all scramble for number 65 on the second book and look at it mm -hmm. oh god all that thing yeah I was like that so, in the beginning, was it overwhelming for you to write all those parts for everybody because you're the leader? Not at all. I enjoyed it mm. very much mm. because I wanted to hear that music that I've written. Yeah. And I wanted to hear it from them and to hear how it sounded. Because that was the only way that time. It was not, there was no MIDI. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I needed good musicians, so I tried to get good musicians around me. And then I was lucky to get uh, uh, people like Braz, Carlton Kito, one of the best guitar players this country has ever had, yes. jazz guitar player. Yes. Yeah, Peter Saldana on bass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Johnny Edmonds on drums. Oh God, what a band! Yeah, what a band! What a band! I was quite blown. I mean, I just spent this morning listening to that that time, that music that you created. It's just mind-boggling. So, when you're uh, mostly performing music, even the pop tunes which, which were famous that time, you had your own take on everything. And uh, absolutely, even on classical really? music. Yeah. So, when you <laughs> when you are jazzing up a pop tune. What is your process like? How, wh what are you thinking when you're wanting to reharmonize something or rearrange something? Yeah, I wanted to sound different, definitely. Yeah, but I didn't want to play it the same way that I heard it. And I, I had musicians who supported me on that, especially Pam Crane, mm. who sing pop songs the way I wrote it. Mm. And she was such a great singer, yeah, that she could sing and twist the song around any way and sing a song in any key. She wouldn't tell me, hey, that key is too high for me or key is too low for me. She would just adjust her ranges accordingly. It was amazing. What mm. an amazing singer. Amazing singer. Yeah, yeah. So when you're rearranging a pop tune, what are you thinking of exactly? How do you do it? How, what's your process? How do I make it jazzy? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a method to it. Do you follow the same method uh, always that you want to write bass part the, first? I would... I work on the harmonies. Okay. Yeah. And try to color it differently mm -hmm. and put some, not overdo it because, I mean, if there's a C major chord, uh, 
uh, pop tunes are full of triads. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The C major chord, uh, the most you can do is play a major seventh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes even a major seventh doesn't work. So you play a C suspended. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that doesn't take it away too much from the pop flavor. But you don't do flat five and you know yeah, a thirteenth and eleventh in the sharp end and all that. Mm. All that you don't do because that's overdoing it and then you might just kill the song. You make sure So you, you have to be careful. You have to be careful, yeah. How you do it, yeah. Uh, but you can make it interesting harmonically. So first yeah. is you're designing the harmony and you're making it different harmonically. And then what do you think of after that? Bus. Play some, some solos on it. That's it. <laughs> call the best drummer. A pop tune with, a pop tune. Call pop the best tune with jazz solos. That was my approach. Everybody heard my pop tune. You say, oh, yeah, that's Louis. Yeah, jazz solos are in the pop tune. <laughs> <laughs> you were... <laughs> So how many times, uh, I, I know that once in one of your interviews, I don't remember which one, you were mentioning that you jazzed up a classical piece and then the manager came and told you that, hey, people are not able to understand what's going on. Uh, yes, I was in Kathmandu Salty Hotel. And the, the manager, British manager, uh, comes to me, Louis. Uh, I like your playing, but the people cannot understand what you're playing. <laughs> Try to keep it simple. It's interesting. Because I would take Chopin's preludes mm -hmm. and change it around. You know, that was like in the afternoon or afternoon sessions, we would take some of the simple pieces, uh, classical pieces, Chopin, Mozart and all that. But I would change it around. Mm -hmm. If now, do you ever... I would get bored playing the same tune the same way every time. That's right. I mean, a jazz man doesn't do that. You've got correct? to challenge yourself again and again. Yeah. Every every tune is played differently twice. That's Never right. the same twice. Never the same twice. Yeah. That's why it's hard to tell That's a jazz man to do mime. Correct. It's a tough one. So, it's a tough one, yeah. if you had a uh, the chance right now to do, to make a full album recording live, like you did in the 70s. Would you take that up? Would you like to do that again, where you do That's just record the whole album live then and there, be it NCP or somewhere I'd else? I'd love to do it. Uh, what kind I'd of music would you like to do? My own. Your own. <laughs> but <laughs> your own music and is also so diverse. There is this whole, there are eras in it. That's also something very fascinating about it. Yeah. And then now I'm fascinated, uh, uh, by, uh, requested, of course, by many of my friends. And say, why don't you do some standards? Right. Yeah. Originals are fine, but uh, we want to hear some standards played by you. So I'm recording standards and uh, I've, uh, mm -hmm. of course, everything reharmonized mm -hmm. totally. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, one album is out already, actually. I think it's out there on Facebook mm -hmm. or YouTube. Uh, it's called New Standards. And I'm working on another one. Yeah. Uh, a, an album of standards. Right. And this I would like to play on, li on uh, live. Wow. Really. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a great one. So, Uncle Ben, you were in this whole... Uh, your advertising business is going well. Your gigs are going well. Everything is flying for you. Did you have, uh, like right now, a lot of musicians see some other musician as competition or see somebody else and feel things that maybe, you know, I, sh I want to get as good as this guy or, you know, I want to improve my playing because that person is playing better than me. Like in one of your stories, you mentioned how somebody came up to you and told, uh, told you that there are 10 more piano players who are better than you in Calcutta. And then you were wondering that how can I go there and check them out? What was that feeling? Did you feel that, uh, uh, did you feel a surge, in, like something sank inside that, oh shit, there are better people than me, I need to work harder, I need to check them out, or do I have to go there and get inspired? What was it exactly for you emotionally? 
yes, I felt that I should go there and get inspired uh -huh. and then improve myself. Definitely, yeah. Uh, and did you see any and of show these people? That, uh, yeah, I even met them. Yeah. And I wasn't terribly impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so that lady lied to you. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And uh, maybe she was sent by them. So <laughs> whoever this person told but, you told you that there are better people uh, there in Calcutta. But I always believe that uh, each musician has his own voice, really. Yeah, definitely. It's not a race. Yeah, it's not a hundred meters race that you, this guy is better than the other guy. And yeah, it's not that. Yeah. Everybody is different. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain standard you have to maintain in your thinking and playing. And uh, of course, playing fast is OK. Uh, but playing fast all the time is not okay mm -hmm. yeah because music has to have emotions yeah so in fact i think the most difficult things to play slow mm. yeah the most difficult i find the most difficult thing is to play a ballad mm. yeah and to keep it interesting from beginning to end a slow ballad with no tempo also it's oh. the most difficult thing, difficult piece to play, really difficult thing to do. Fast music, if fast playing, you can just fly away as fast as your fingers can move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For that, of course, you got to practice. Uh, young sister, tell me, hey, how can you play so fast and all that? I said, you have to practice to play fast. You have to practice fast. Right. Yeah, you play your scales and then you play that scale in different speeds mm. and take it as fast as possible. Mm. If you don't practice like that, you'll never be able to play fast. Right. So it, your solo has to be a mix of everything. Yeah. But don't let go of the emotion. Right. So emotionally, uh, talking about improvisation, particularly, that's what you do a lot of the times. So there are projects when you are playing with people you are mentoring, you are playing with younger musicians and uh, Gino is there, everybody is there and you are improvising. Of the time, most of the time, most of the time. But yeah. here is what I want to ask, how different is it for you as a musician when you are sitting in the ensemble where Zakir Ji is playing, Dave Holland is playing, you are touring the stage, Sanjay is on guitar. Do you, what is different about, because that playing sounds completely uh, like you sound, you are connected to a different uh, muse altogether. The muse you pull down when you want to compose. That's what you said in one of the interviews I was listening to. <laughs> the, you seem like you're you're feeling a very different thing. Is it different for you when you're playing with people you're mentoring versus when you're playing with legends who are like you and at a level like yours? Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely is different. So what is different yeah. about it? I guess... Uh, uh, when you know that you have some of the greatest musicians playing uh, in the band and uh, you're playing one of your tunes with them <laughs> and yeah, that is, can be frightening and it's also because you don't know how they're going to take your compositions and the harmonies that you have given onto those tunes and all that fear is inside you and all that. And you try to do even better mm -hmm. as a composer, and yeah, and it's a it's a challenge. It's a very big challenge actually. And then, but the reward is great mm. when they really appreciate what you've done, mm. and that is really great. I'm so happy to hear that, Uncle. I mean, um, thank you so much. We are all, we've almost hit an hour right now. And, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's better like 20 minutes. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, anything you would like to add? Anything you would like to uh, uh, talk about? Some music that's coming out? Album that is about to be released? When is it about to be released? What is long overdue is you and me have to play together. Yes, sir. I am, I'm going One to be One of these there. days, I, must, I want to call you over. 
I'll be there. And ex explore some music with you. Yes, I'll be there. Uh, yeah, that's, I'm missing that, huh? <laughs> I, miss, <laughs> I miss coming to your place too. It's been a really long time. Yeah, yeah. We have to meet. We have to meet and explore some music. Yeah. For sure. For I'll sure. definitely yeah. be there. Uncle and uh, before that, yes. you want to do it on the go or you want some music beforehand? Uh, beforehand you, will be good. Be then I can, uh, uh, you know, be ready for it. Uh, so sort of, sort of prepare yourself a little bit. Yes. Yeah. Your music is something that I can't pick up on the fly that, okay, you know, good to go. So I would like to listen and to it, then, be ready okay. and come and uh, do whatever is needed. Yeah. But we the must do it. Huh? For sure. Yeah. For sure. I'll soon, be there. And soon, soon. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I wish you all the best with your playing. Of course, you're doing great things. Yeah. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you so much. Yeah. Means a lot. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you. I'm very thankful. Thank you for coming to the School of Bass podcast. And uh, we'll connect soon. I'm just stopping the we'll recording connect. for now. Okay. I keep talking so to lovely you. Lovely talking to you, <laughs> Lovely talking to you. Yeah. Thank you, Uncle. All the best. All, all the best. best. And take care. Stay safe. Thank you God so bless. much.